Good morning, church. Uh, in God's word this morning, we're hearing from Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 to 4. If you want to turn to that, Matthew chapter 8, verse 1 to 4. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone. But go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Uh, in case you're not aware, um, we have finished our series of sermons in 1 Peter. And uh, next week, as I understand it, we'll be taking on 2 Peter. But in the meantime, we're going to focus on a miracle. We usually do a psalm in between a series, you know, in between series. Um but I uh, spoke to Steve, oh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and I said, oh, I'm sick of storms, Steve. Can I do a miracle? Let's do a miracle, mate, you know. So, well, so it's, uh, that's what we're about this morning. We've got a miracle in our hands. So um, we're going to uh, focus our concentration on this man with leprosy. Good stuff. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that we're the object, each one of us is the object. In fact, every person is the object of your personal attention and care every second, every minute, every day of our lives. Nothing escapes you. We're always under your perpetual surveillance. And uh, Father, we thank you for your supernatural power. You're able to bring people back to life. You're able to heal and cleanse and restore and rebuild. And as we turn our attention, Father, to this, um, to this miracle that happened so long ago, uh, we pray that you would instruct us through it and that uh, we may be more knowledgeable as a result, but not merely more knowledgeable, but more knowledgeable and more willing to be obedient and compliant and live in harmony with your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever met somebody who is always right? Always right. <laughs> did I say some, did I say somebody, their husband over there? Yeah. Oh, okay. I can't remember. Um, you talk to them about um, politics and they get, you get the impression that they're always right. Uh, you talk to them about a particular sport, rugby league, rugby union, swimming, the Olympics, whatever, soccer, and they sort, of, they sort of come across as they're always right. Um, you have a con- conversation uh, with them about, you know, um, land rights for humpback whales, and, 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 and they're always right. Well, friends, there's only one person who is always right, okay? There's only one person who's always right, and that's Jesus. Jesus is always right, You see, in trying to convince his readership that Jesus is the promised Messiah, Matthew shows us that Jesus is always right. Always right. In chapter 1, Matthew informs us that Jesus has the right genealogy. He was uh, born of the line of Abraham and David. In chapter 2, Matthew informs us that uh, Jesus has the right birth. He was born of the virgin. In chapter 3, we notice that he had the right baptism. He was affirmed by the Father and anointed by the Spirit. In chapter 4, we see he has the right test. His victory over temptation in the wilderness demonstrated his power over Satan. In chapter 5 and 6, we see that he preached the right message. He preached uh, like someone who had absolute authority. He preached the word of God with absolute authority, not like the teachers of the law. And that brings us to chapters 8 and 9, where Matthew shows us that Jesus has the right power, which is the focus of our concentration here this morning, the supernatural power of Jesus. 
So to convince his Jewish readership that Jesus is always right, that Jesus is the promised Messiah, Matthew shows us that he has the right genealogy, the right birth, the right baptism, the right test, and the right message. And in chapters 8 and 9, the right power, the right power. For in these chapters, uh, Matthew records nine, just nine of the countless miracles that were performed by Jesus. And they're examples of his divine power. There's their credentials of the Messiah. They're really signs, you know, miraculous signs that point convincingly to his deity. For only the divine being, only God himself in human flesh could have done or performed such miracles. And the tragedy was, friends, that after the miracles contained in chapters 8 and 9, the Jewish leaders especially the scribes and the Pharisees, concluded that Jesus is of the devil. Is of the devil. In chapters 9, verse 34, Matthew shows that Jesus has done everything possible to prove and to demonstrate that he is God, the Messiah. Everything possible to show that his supernatural power, power can only be attributed to God and the Jewish religious establishment, the Jewish hierarchy, conclude the exact opposite. Exact opposite. What do we conclude from this? What does one learn from this? Well, witnessing a miracle or experiencing a miracle does not produce faith. Why? Because the Bible quite clearly teaches that faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of God. Faith comes from hearing the gospel of Jesus. Message through the word of God. When Paul wrote to the believers at Ephesus, he said, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. So you see, we're justified on the basis of God's grace appropriated through a personal exercising of faith in Jesus. And this is not of yourselves. It's a gift from God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now, it's recorded in chapter 5, verse 1. When Jesus saw the multitudes, he went up the mountain, up the mountainside, sat down and began to teach them. And after he taught them, chapter 8, verse 1 states, you'll notice that Jesus came down from the mountainside. Now, scholars refer to this as the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, Jesus confronted and challenged the religious beliefs and practices of Judaism. And he exposed them for the religious hypocrites and spiritual imposters that they were. You see, in contrast to other Jewish teachers, Jesus never quoted the the Talmud or the Mishnah, their ancient Jewish writings, um, or other religious teachers. He never quoted other religious teachers. um, And he recognized no written authority other than the Old Testament scriptures. And that was simply because he didn't need to. You see, he didn't need to because Jesus himself is the embodiment of God's truth. He is the embodiment of God's truth. Jesus is God and speaks the truth of God, speaks the words of God. And let me say this, truth is undermined. Truth is diminished in the church when Christians are willing to compromise it to avoid offending people. Clearly, they do not understand. They do not understand that love flourishes only in the context of biblical truth. That's why uh, God calls on us, or God has instructed us, to speak the truth in love. See, the two go together. That's why uh, Jesus is referred to as someone who is full of grace and truth. Truth in the context of a loving relationship is is God's intention. And we need to to maintain the balance between the two. Because you cannot have one without the other. You must have love with truth or grace and truth. You see, the world doesn't need another opinion, friends. It doesn't need another opinion. What it needs is God's truth spoken in love. And you'll notice in verses 28 and 29, 
the people's response of chapter 7, the people's response to this Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Now, if you enter into the reality of the human situation, if you put yourself in the there and then, uh, we used to have a term for this, if you put yourself into the shoes of the Jews, the questions that would have arose in the minds of the Jewish leadership and the teachers of the law as a consequence of such challenging and confronting teaching would have been obvious. It would have been obvious. Who is this man? By what authority do you speak? Why should I believe what you're saying, Jesus? And so the miracles contained in chapters 8 and 9, friends, you see, provide the answers to these questions. They really do. The fact that Jesus cleansed lepers, healed paralytics, the fact that he touched Peter's mother-in-law who had a fever and a fever left her, the fact that he calmed the storm, cast out demons, made the blind see, the dumb to speak, the lepers cleansed the lepers, lame to walk, the fact he healed every disease and sickness that was brought to him demonstrated that he was Israel's promised Messiah and that he had the right and that he had the authority to speak as he did, to preach as he did. See, Jesus preached with a divine authority and he demonstrated his divine authority in a supernatural way. And so we read in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 8, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, there are a number of diseases uh, recorded in the Bible, and leprosy was one of the most serious, one of the most serious. And according to the instruction that God gave Israel in Leviticus 13, 13 any person who had contracted leprosy was forced to live in isolation from everyone else. Normally, a leper wouldn't dare approach another person to communicate with them. You see, such a, an act was sort of unthinkable and, and um, forbidden and shameful, and it was contrary to the Old Testament law, the mo law of Moses. They were ostracized um, and forbidden to attend the temple. They were ostracized from their fellow Jews. Lepers were to exhibit their grief by tearing their clothes. And in the event that they did come into contact with a, another person, they were to cover their mouths and make an announcement of their presence by crying out, unclean, unclean, so they could be avoided. So no one would go near them. They were excluded from the temple and the Talmud f uh, prohibited a Jew from coming any closer than six feet to a leper. And if there was a strong wind blowing, the distance was increased to 150 feet. You know, of all the 61 defilements in Judaism, the worst was coming into contact with a dead body. The next was contracting leprosy. Consequently, people avoided lepers at all costs, at all costs. And a number of scholars believe that God had a, a purpose uh, because of the physical ugliness of the disease, God had a spiritual purpose in making lepers as ceremonially unclean. You see, leprosy was a, a graphic illustration of sin, a graphic illustration of sin. Sin affects the whole body, you see. Sin is ugly, it's contaminating, it's incurable by man and alienates people, makes people outcasts. So every leper not only lived with the social stigma of his own disease, but also with the stigma of being a, a walking illustration of sin. One rabbi said that when he saw lepers, he threw stones at them to keep them away. Another said that he wouldn't even eat an egg bought in a street where a leper had passed by. In 2 Samuel 2.29, David curses the house of Joab that it might never be without a leper. That was evidently one of the worst things you could say to somebody. I submit all human senses would have been arrested and repulsed 
by a person suffering from such a hideous and horrid and frightening disease. Dr. Luke records that this man was covered, literally covered with leprosy. So what we have here is an advanced case, an advanced case. Therefore, in light of what you've just heard about leprosy, what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do in verse 3? He reached out his hand and touched the man. So Jesus touches someone who's considered to be at the lowest level of human existence. A man, because of his disease, was ranked the most amongst uh, ranked among, among the most objectionable and disgusting people in society. And Jesus touches the man. It was prohibited to touch lepers, according to the law of Moses, according to Leviticus five three. It was against the law. To do so was to render yourself physically and ceremonially defiled. So Jesus does not merely accept the company of a social outcast, but he touches one. He touches one. But when you think about it, friends, a touch from somebody clean was probably what the leper longed for. A simple gesture of acceptance. A simple expression of compassion after being forced to live in isolation from everyone else and the psychological damage as a result of that social stigma, Jesus reaches out his hand and touches him. Although he clearly didn't have to. We all know that. Jesus clearly didn't have to. Jesus could have been a a great distance away when he healed him as he did with the centurion servant in the same chapter, Matthew 8. You see, Jesus could heal people whether they're absent or present. You see, his word had equal power in both circumstances, in both situations. But with this man with leprosy, he reaches out his hand and touches him, which when you think about it is really an implied rebuke (laughs) to the scribes and the Pharisees. They never would have humbled themselves or lowered their pious dignity to even minister to the man's basic needs. It's interesting, isn't it, you know? Repeatedly we read through the Gospels that Jesus proclaims that the Jewish religious establishment were derelict in their ministry responsibilities. While at the same time he embraces with open arms open arms, those who were considered to be at the lowest level of human existence. The low life, the scum of society, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, the diseased, the broken, the busted, the bleeding, the wounded, and the lepers. Let me make this impress. You see, Jesus places great value on a life that many in his time considered worthless. He looks at the wreckage produced by sin and sees in the most pathetic individual a person of great worth and great potential. Jesus is not concerned with what the world thinks of people. He's not concerned with what people think of others. He's not hindered or hampered in his ministry to people by those you know, discriminations and biases and prejudices that affect us so much. Maybe society has given some people a low self-esteem and told them that they're not worth anything. But let me assure you, friends, Jesus doesn't think like that. And neither should we. Neither should we. Without a moment's concern for what people think, Jesus reaches out his hand and touches him. He compassionately responds to this man's appeal. But, of course, life consists more than just uh, the physical. But, you see, Jesus is concerned and deeply loves those who are afflicted and those who are diseased and those who are deformed. He's a God of compassion and he feels for humanity deeply, not only concerned for the spiritual realm but also the physical as well. 
And it needs to be made clear, in keeping with Matthew's intention in writing to Jews, his Jewish readership, when Jesus touches this man with leprosy, he, according to the law of Moses, becomes defiled. Make no mistake. But what is explicit here, what is very clear here, is that Jesus has the power to cleanse defilement. He has the power to cleanse it, which sort of projects us forward and sort of symbolizes us symbolizes in advance the nature of his toning death. Where he calls on everybody to come to him and be washed and cleansed and purified from the stain and the pollution and the impurity of sin. To quote the old hymn, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? When I was a boy growing up in Sydney, the only takeaway food we had in all of Reesby was fish and chips, greasy fish and chips. My favourite was a battered sav, you know? (laughs) Fish and chip shops were common in Sydney back in the day, but now not so much. And I think one of the contributing factors, one of the factors that contributed to their demise is that you have to wait around for your food. You have to wait around for your food. Uh, You placed your order, you waited for it to be cooked, you paid for it, and then you left. In this day and age where many people believe the lie that we, um, uh, we don't have enough time, that we're all time poor, waiting around for food to be cooked um, is just not acceptable. I mean, you go to McDonald's, KFC, uh, Red Rooster drive through and the food is almost immediate. You, you don't have to wait around. Now, why am I telling you this? Well, when Jesus touches this man with leprosy in verse 3, friends, and says, be clean, you'll notice what happens. You'll notice what happens. Verse 3, immediately, immediately he is cleansed of his leprosy. So instantaneously, this man who is literally covered with leprosy is cured, is healed, is restored. So there's no placing your order and waiting around. Instantaneously, this man is cured of his leprosy. And essentially, all of Christ's miracles were immediate, were instantaneous. Jesus did not heal progressively or gradually, although on two occasions he did heal uh, in two stages. But predominantly, his healings were immediate, complete, and permanent. You know, we have no record of anyone reverting back to their former condition and we have no record of anyone who was partially healed. So there was no recovery period. There was no recuperation time uh, when it comes to the healing ministry of Jesus. There was no need for physiotherapy or occupational therapy or hydrotherapy or even psychotherapy. And he did so with a word or a touch, whether you were in his presence or not. Irrelevant. Jesus healed immediately. There was no drawn-out period of recovery or restoration or healing, regardless of how serious the deformity or the disease. You know, it always interests me when I read of or hear somebody say, you know, I went to the, the church healing service the other day and I've been getting better ever since. Is that right? Well, Jesus healed immediately, and there's a reason for it, instantaneously. And furthermore, unlike so many faith, so many so-called faith healers who leave long lines of people, long lines of disappointed and disillusioned people in anguish and despair, Jesus healed everyone that was brought to him. Everyone. How do I know that? Well, look with me on the screen at Matthew 8, 16. Thanks, Hamish. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the evil spirits with a word and healed all their sick. Not some of them, not a number of them, all of them. Thanks, Hamish. In Luke 4, we read these words. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses or sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. 
Thanks, Hamish. And Luke 9, 11, he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and he healed those who needed healing. Not some of them, not a number of them, all of them. Healed those who needed healing. See, Jesus healed all those who were brought to him. So he didn't leave long lines of disillusioned and discouraged and disappointed people in anguish. And you'll notice contrary to many faith healers today, friends, there were no theatrics in the healing ministry of Jesus. There were no theatrics. There were no gimmicks. There were no formulas in the healing ministry of Jesus. No one being pushed over or falling over backwards to try and prove that this is the power of God. Jesus simply reached out his hand, touched the man, said, be clean, and immediately he is cleansed of his leprosy. So the healing of this man with leprosy, as, as with all but two of Christ's miracles, was immediate, was permanent, and it was complete. And of course, if Jesus did not, this is the thing you've got to think about. If Jesus did not heal people immediately, if he did not heal people in an instant, if he, if he, if he had not exercised his power for all to see and healed immediately and, and cured in, in, instantly, then there would be no miraculous evidence to, to reveal his de deity or authenticate his teaching. His critics and contract contractors or detractors could easily say that uh, healing was a result of the natural healing power of the body. Jesus and the healer install people, restoring people immediately, friends, for all to see, puts his supernatural power on public display, you see. It puts it on display for all to see. And it reveals his identity. It reveals who he is, the Messiah, God incarnate and authenticates his preaching and his teaching. Therefore, those who opposed Jesus could not maintain with any credibility that this healing had occurred some other way. Immediately, completely, and permanently reveals that Jesus is Israel's Messiah, and he has the right, and he has the authority to speak and to preach as he did. You see, in the person of Jesus, we see God at work. You know, since the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden, disease, sickness, decay, and death have been a terrible reality. Have they not? Terrible reality. And for millennia, the search for cures and treatments and medicines has been ongoing from the primitive witch doctors and medicine men to the highly sophisticated complex hospitals with extensively trained and educated doctors, surgeons and specialists, the need for healing continues. Well, with all the money spent and all the time invested, no one can come anywhere near what Jesus has done here. Anywhere near it. If a health professional touched somebody with leprosy, they became defiled. But when Jesus touches him, immediately he is cleansed, he is cured of his leprosy, healed by his power. Even though leprosy had eaten, this, eaten away this man's facial features, uh, eyes, eyelashes, eyebrows, uh, nose, throat, would have made his skin bloody and scaly. Um, caused his fingers and toes to be worn down and made him hunch over. And although uh, advanced leprosy um, generally is not painful because of the nerve damage that you have to live with, it is def disfiguring, debilitating and repulsive. But Jesus exercises a creative power to heal this man and restore his health. And he does it immediately, completely, and permanently. 
With all due respect, in comparison to that omnipotent display, all modern healings and all advancement in medical science really fades into absolute nothingness, doesn't it? With respect. I mean, you can go to the best doctors, you can consult the best surgeons, you can be examined by the high-profile specialists and so on, but none of them will be able to replicate what Jesus has done here. See, Jesus and Jesus alone is able to recreate parts of the body that have been destroyed by the effects of the fall. Power to heal leprosy immediately, completely, and permanently. The capacity to heal a man covered with, letr- sorry, covered with leprosy instantly with a mere touch would baffle the minds of all the physicians on earth. You see, friends, there's no one to compare with Jesus. There's no one to compare with Jesus. And let me end with this. Someday, one day, someday, one day, there'll be no more disease, sickness, decay or death. Someday, one day, there'll be no more crying, mourning or pain. Someday, one day, Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Look forward to that day. Thank you.